right well thank you for uh, this zoom invitation um um, I had my real espresso coffee instead of virtual coffee and all the wonderful wine and dine you would have given me. So I will get started with my talk. And, um, you know, my own uh, work is more in the field of neuroprocesses, brain machine interface, but we found a very good niche here uh, of role of neuromorphic and neuroprocesses. And as you just heard that, uh, in the area of tactile sensing. And <clears throat> I'm gonna present a more of a panoramic view of uh, the prosthesis and then tactile sensing and the neuromorphic and then some future direction. So obviously that's, that's uh, a lot. And what I would, I'll ask at some point how I'm, I'm doing on time. That way, things like future directions, I can cut it out or such, okay? So please guide me on my time, but I'm expecting the usual 45, 50 minutes Q&A. Feel free to interrupt since this is a small group and friendly collaborative group. I say collaborative because, you know, we have written grants and paper, particularly starting with GERT, but others. So I, I'll take it in that spirit, okay. So I think what I would want to do, since not all of you work on the topic of prosthesis, so I'll give a bit of an introduction there so that it sets the stage for uh, neuromorphic in, as I said, neuromorphic meets neuroprocesses. So for all of you, um, you know, prosthesis may mean two extremes, um, you know, uh, on one hand, even now more traditional are these cap and hook kind of uh, processes that are so solid, robust, tried and true. And many of us have watched Star Wars likes movie and we say, oh, well, that's the future of processes. But the reality is something in between, uh, thanks to wars and all of that and DARPA's investment, a lot of um, high tech futuristic, which is like DECA, ARM and Johns Hopkins uh, APL uh, modular processes limb came about because these are anthropomorphic, human-like, multi-fingered, and um, that spun off number of companies, uh, iLIM, Touch Autobot, Touch Bionic, so on and so forth, who made them more affordable. So now once you see this kind of an end, then it pretty much very quickly makes you realize that it would be great to have human-like sensory information along with the motor multi-fingered solutions. So with that, um, you know, and DARPA was the history and this is one of probably my first patient. She's an MPT and this is the ultra first generation well before any, any of these commercial were there. We set her up with the myelectric uh, recording and decoding system. So what you see here is that she is, uh, has got an array of electrodes around her residual limb. The signals are being decoded and then she can effortlessly seemingly open and close her hand or move her individual finger. So it's a kind of fairly old story. I would say if you want to get into really somewhat contemporary what has really changed is the limb itself. So this is the modular processes limb, which is more anthropomorphic. In this particular case, it still uses that something called myoband, uh, which still does the decoding, but you can see that it's more effortless, it's load and other conditions, various tasks. So algorithms have improved as also the control, but it's still very active area of research, including my lab, one of the PhD students is doing this sort of machine learning pattern recognition. This is not the only approach. You can see that there is a real challenge of uh, interfacing. And so this is a technique called targeted muscle re-innovation. So in which case for somebody who has lost a limb all the way to the shoulder, the signals from the brain go to the nerve, to the muscles, and then you can decode this. And so this is that uh, type of a uh, technique which lets you do the decoding through muscle signal as an amplifier. And it's actually, this has become a very, this and its variation of it has become a big project in my lab because nerve signals are very difficult. Brain signals require 
brain surgery. And if you can get through muscle, the, all the decoding in an implantable system, that'll be great. But all of this is still, by the way, motor, right? So we'll come to sensory very quickly. Now, um, uh, what, what I would say is that to decode, I mean, you know, from the first video, whatever I presented, you can uh, say, well, if we fast forward, what do we have? So today, definitely for decoding and classification of muscle signals from that forearm, the signals that you saw, an EMG signal looked like something like this in red and blue. You have to do the classification, which is the central problem, so that you can open, close, move fingers to different grasps and some of the deep temporal convolutional network and so on clearly like in many different areas seem to work quite well. So this was work done by one of my PhDs from Joseph Betauser. Uh, and you know, testing with a modular processes limb is a big deal. It's expensive, difficult, cumbersome. So now we have all these augmented reality software and simulators available so that you can do decoding. And so this is the TCN being tested to uh, look at the actual versus decoded movement. And, you know, you can get good performance. There are still inaccuracies and lags, uh, but this is probably a reasonably close to the state of the art in terms of using machine learning, high density set of electrodes and achieving kind of fine dexterous uh, decoding. Okay, so we're still in the motor and then bulk of my talk will shift to sensory. And so, can we use it? Yeah, I mean, this is a spin-off from our lab and collaborators now for many years, Infinite Biomedical Technology. You can see this gentleman is wearing the limb, is using it in an effortless sort of a way um, and doing multiple tasks. There's some more tricks here than you may recognize, not just decoding, but, but at least you can see that dexterous processes are now potentially practical every day. Uh, okay. And, uh, you know, it's not my only lab, so I just want to give credit to uh, so many other places, but uh, here is an example from the uh, robotics group at uh, in PISA, and then they collaborate with EPFL through Silvestro Machera. So, you know, here is gentleman is using the hand, uh, is able to write, he'll drive, uh, and such. So, I mean, obviously this is not as, aesthetically beautiful. I mean, that takes some commercialization to get it to the level, but the functionality is very good. Okay, so I hope everyone has some glimpse, nice videos to know about processes and upper limb processes, of course, and that how practical they become. Okay, so now I'll get to what I gave the title as that neuromorphic meets neuroprocesses, right? So why do we need to do that? So, so far what you saw was the motor, right? Like you think and your brain sends the message and then you decode either from brain directly or from nerves or from muscles and achieve the motor control. But what about the sensory, the, the feedback the, that you would want to get? So that sensory feedback, um, needs to relate back in the same manner. It could be non-invasive uh, through skin. It could be directly via nerves or directly to the brain. And so now that we think about sensory feedback, then the question will be like, what's that feedback? Is it like vibration or electric stimulation or any other ways? And for the matter, what's the code, right? Like how do we, encode that sensory feedback. So that's now become more of an active area of research and I'll elaborate more on this as we go along. Okay, so we switch gear from everybody what hears about is brain machine interface to actually I would call machine to brain interface. And if you're curious, actually at IEEE Biomedical Engineering Conference, EMBC conference that's starting this weekend, uh, on this Saturday, there is a half day workshop on this topic of machine to brain interface that I've organized uh, with a colleague. And I think there are like really wonderful eight, 10 speakers across the world who have been working towards this motor machine to brain interface. So it might be a good way for you to get in-depth immersion 
on that topic, but it's very soon this Saturday through IEEE EMBS conference. Okay, so, so let's get a very ultra quick tutorial on sensory or tactile. And our uh, sense of touch is through the skin, more so in our fingers because they are much higher density of receptors and so on. And you pretty much see four different classes of receptors. Um, and they can be broken down into two groups. So one are fast, they respond rapidly. So which means that if there's a change, then they are rapidly adaptive receptors as they're called. So this so-called Meissner corpuscle, Pacinian corpuscle are rapidly adaptive and they, they encode for a change. On the other end, like Merkel and Ruffini are slow adaptive. So they respond to steady state application of pressure or force. There are nociceptor free nerve endings for pain. And so that's a kind of different topic. So, you know, now you can see that in this case, if it's a sharp object, you know, it may have a different response through the skin. So we are going to mimic that and provide the sensory information. You know, this is a good starting point. And there's a whole different talk. One could do that on um, e-skin or e-dermis, as we call it, dermis, because epidermis is on the top. And a lot of technology on flexible electronics, high density sensing goes into building skin-like or e-skin. And I'm not gonna talk about it today, rather, and I'm gonna focus because of your know, invitation to talk about neuromorphic. So I'll focus on the algorithms. Okay, so that's our skin and we need to mimic it, right? And, um, you know, let's again, get a simple intuitive feel for processes. Uh, a lot of these kind of sensory work started with my uh, former PhD student, Luke Osborne. He has been impressively productive and he is actively looking for faculty position and he has had some really high, highly cited papers and works. Currently he's a scientist at Applied Physics Lab, but this is where he started. So as a graduate student, you know, we, you know, we mounted some of the sensors on the fingertip. Remember, you see that they're kind of like flexible. So there is a whole sensor design, but they're basically single sensors on a fingertip, but just with that single sensor on a fingertip and you can develop a simple slip algorithm and, and or apply appropriate force or pressure. Uh, from there, the project, uh, since I was also going back and forth to Singapore, one of my PhD students there built a high density array. So this is like a skin-like array on the palm. If you see on the, oh, let's see if I can play it, continue to play it, uh, the video stop, but, uh, oh, okay. Well, I'll stretch it forward manually. So what you start seeing on the screen is two types of response. So you can see the red and the black. So the red is say fast response because as soon as you touch something and the black is the slow receptor response. So this kind of a e-skin is a higher density array. It's flexible and it can produce a profile of pressure. And you can see that also from this video that if you put a palm on this, you know, that this uh, student he built it like 100 by 100 channel sensor array. And you can again get the pressure profile from the high, you know, the sensor array. And each of those pixels is the, the signal from the receptor or the sensor, and then it produces spiking cord and all of that, right? So, so again, to recap, therefore we started with motor. Now we are going into sensory. For sensory tactile, we use skin as our model and we are modeling or mimicking the receptors. And then from there, we'll do different things. Okay, so, so then we need to produce, oh, I just uh, maybe one more example. I collaborated with Alcimar Soares, a professor in Brazil, and I think we still collaborate. You know, he made you know, some flexible high density sensors. So when you mount that on finger. So music, okay, all right. Well, so, uh, you know, it's, I'll play it faster because this goes slowly. And, you know, now with the dexterous arm, hand available receptor, we can pick up objects of different shapes, size and uh, aperture. So there's some uh, vision involved as well, which I'm not gonna talk about. 
so that you can uh, create a finger grasp upper aperture for different objects and shapes. So, uh, so this is very practical. We, you know, we, we can even distribute these kind of sensors to people because we've been put, you know, using microfab and circuit is on, embedded on it and so on. So this can be mounted on fingertips for prosthetic hands or robotics, and it could be useful in robotics. But now uh, let's see, go back to higher density. So this is what my uh, PhD student Wang Wei uh, built. So this is a, as I said, 100 by 100 channel sensor with all the FPGA, all the electronics. Uh, it's a multi-layer, so it uses conductive traces, piezoelectric fabric. And then this is the video I just showed you. So this is not obviously mounted on a hand, but with some miniaturization of both sensors and electronics, of course, that should be feasible. And it turns out this is extremely active area. Of course, as you said, the vision as there's a lot more activities in vision in both the cameras and algorithms. But now there's a very active community of people who design organic, flexible, variety of high-tech thing. One of my PhD students, Eric, is working on something significantly highly scalable sensor array. And you know, it would be great if all the electronics could be embedded in neuromorphic chip. So this is where we are going to create high density sensor with high density encoding. Okay, so this is our first generation, say, how do you apply biomimetic algorithm, right? So you have this fabric-like high density sensor. It's gonna produce this spiking activity, slow and fast receptor. So it, you know, like in vision, if you have more, you know, you think about rods and cones in uh, skin, you think about slow and fast adaptive. Uh, and if you're further along multi-layer um, sensing. And so you need to have spikes and then an algorithm. So we took advantage, well, just before I go there, I'll give some algorithmic background. So you need to, you know, for if anyone, I, again, I don't know the audience. So if you have not done neuromorphic or neural network, a very simplistic uh, graphics, uh, which is that neural networks are like, we have these biological networks and you know they have synaptic weights and then different ways of integrating the weight, integrate and fire, whatever, different ways that biological networks might work. And you know, artificial neural network mimic that in algorithm, except for the spiking neural network uh, using some functional, it, it can produce spiking patterns. So now for our tactile sensing, what it's going to do is to produce, when you apply pressure, it's going to produce different types of spike trains and then um, it will travel along the nerve and to uh, different layers. Uh, there is cuneate nucleus, brain. So we could do some encoding at different layers of the spiking activity to interpret what the spike code is about. So let me just go back. So therefore, the goal here is to produce these algorithms that take these array of spike signals. So you know, how, what, how do you convert that into? So we'll need some, these spike trains that are produced from multiple receptors. Uh, you know, there is some kernel that should be applied that will convert that into a map, right? From the analog to spiking to the code that is similar to uh, what you might see in the skin. To be honest, later on, we've simplified all of that. And perhaps you're all, many of you should be familiar with the uh, Isakevich uh, neuron model and just made life so much simpler because computationally very efficient. Okay, so uh, if you want to do tactile encoding, then you design the sensor, you apply some force or something, uh, you produce this spike, you know, the pressure profile from that, do the spike encoding and then you know, some thresholding, and then you'll have some spiking neural network to uh, encode. So the first one we did a while ago, many years ago, was extreme learning machine. Uh, it was kind of coincidental. One of our neuromorphic community uh, faculty, Arindam Basu, was at NTU uh, in Singapore. It's another university there, and Arindam is active in neuromorphic field, and he had built an ELM chip. ELM is a single layer neural network, right? So it's computationally 
efficient. There's the learning is extremely limited. Basically, it, it starts with preset weights and then some modification occurs, but it's really fast and it's single layer. And so it can be implemented in a single chip. So, uh, you know, my PhD student uh, Madhi Rosili uh, collaborated with Arindam's team. So we implemented our, um, you know, the receptor model. So this is our fabric. Uh, if you put an object, you see that first it'll produce this spatiotemporal spiking patterns. Um, and then it went into the ELM chip and then ELM chip becomes a classifier and it classifies different objects. So as the, this video shows, it's very, for a limited data set, right? Limited set of objects for limited classifier. Um, it, it was a very quick solution. I mean, this is like, you know, three to five year old story, but this was how we got started to convert, ELM, you know, neuromorphic even into silicon for a robotic e-skin type application. So the classifier becomes a you know, emerging challenge, right? Because if you have different objects, so what you are getting when you do this kind of live video you know, experiment is as you saw in the animation here that the spikes are coming and you need to do the classification to say which object it is. Or in real life, that's how it looks, right? So these are our spike trains from the slow fast receptor from the e-skin producing the spiking activity. And then you'd need to apply a classifier. So let's say it's one of the two, four, six objects. So it's a limited solution, but this was an algorithm that uh, Wang Wei published on uh, this sort of a classifier based on spikes for tactile objects. Uh, I've recently been collaborating with uh, this guy, Mahmoud. He came to Singapore as a postdoc, and then now he's continuing that work in uh, Iran. But you know, you can see that this will be, this can very well be multi-layer problem, right? Because you start with a skin sensor, then you have a patch of skin. And then as you will I'll describe a little bit later, there are different layers in the nervous system to which you can go about. But throughout what we'll want to do is to worry about the spiking pattern. So I, I'll, I'll, I think this kind of video will give you some ideas. So first of all, let me show you what in a way, finite element would show you. I don't know whether the audio comes across or not, but this is an you know FEM animation of a skin touch receptors, right? So if you have a skin that deforms, which puts different force or pressure depending on the area on the receptors, and those receptors produce that sound that you hear, if you can hear, are the spikes. That's, that, that's how what's happening in our, when we touch anything. So if we now do the simulation, and as I said, now we kind of switch to Isakevich model, uh, which is a basically computationally mimics variety of neural activities, then this is what you get. So again, to remind you, skin has two types of receptors, slow and fast, but it also can be multi-layered. So there are two of them are kind of closer to the surface to are at the bottom. So you can imagine that the epidermal, the surface receptor is more sensitive. The one below is less sensitive and all of them will produce the spiking activity. So now you can see the different objects, what they create, right? So now from the spiking activity, you can try to derive an object shape. So this um, uh, gives you some idea that high density sensor pressure profile, which is in the below red and blue, and then the spiking activity comes together and potentially as you develop algorithms, it can be used for object classification. Okay, so moving along, uh, you know, we can continue to reduce this to practice. So this is what I was talking about, how the uh, spiking uh, responses are produced. This is uh, Dipesh, one of my, uh, again, postdocs. He is now a professor in India. Uh, he, you know, they, you know, he and the team developed this sensor array. You mount it on a robotic fingertip, but this is paper in your computing is now about, well, what can I do with it? Can I detect an edge? Because really if, when we are palpating with our hand and finger, you know, these are different things you can do, like detect an edge, shape, texture. So the basic model then is a sensor. Uh, 
some transformation based on the model of the receptor, use the Isakevich neuron model to produce a spiking response. And then in this case, at the edge of an any object, uh, you can get these analog response or the spiking response. And then in this paper, he and other students went on to solve the problem, how do you detect an edge? Okay, so uh, no, I think I already showed you. So not only we are now able to detect edge, but shape. So some examples. And last but not the least is texture. Um, so this is the work of one of my recent PhD students, uh, Sri Rama Sri Shankar. Uh, he's is in, I think he's the third year of PhD. But you know this is the work he started with this for his masters and continued on to PhD. is published in Soft Robotics. So what she worked with is this, again, our piezo uh, multilayer fabric. So that's the soft skin. The problem he's solving is texture. Like if we have, so if you, if you present the, the prosthetic hand, the robotic hand with different objects, then you know, it can be ridges. It could be dimples like this, different textures. We tested a variety of different textures and so first thing he needs is this soft skin. His own work has progressed in the direction of creating soft fingers. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have the video of this, but it's a pneumatically actuated soft finger. So we are trying to make it more biomimetic. So not like a robotic metallic finger, but soft finger with a soft skin mounted on top of it. And then we are back to these neuromorphic encoding and a classifier that then can tell whether you're detecting an edge or detecting a texture. Uh, I'm not showing the result, but you know, he achieved very high classification accuracy uh, based on all of this. So, so let's go back to our title, neuromorphic meets neuroprocesses. So this is what it is, neuromorphic meaning e-skin, uh, spiking neural activity, then encoding that, and then developing classifier for basic units like edge, shape, and now even texture, okay? So this is the where our research is continuing. I kind of want to end uh, with some of the algorithmic works. This Mark is uh, also one of the PhD students who came via Berkeley to Hopkins and he is as an electrical engineer, but he, he, I think, you know, he has attended some of the neuromorphic uh, programs and he's very interested in this topic. And, um, you know, he's, he said, can we take it further, right? So one is, so you saw that we can do textures, right? So one is this sensors, soft finger, um, then uh, reading from the sensors, the spike conversion, but now he's looking at these algorithms of channel selection, which are the best sensors, most um, selective to encoding purpose. The second part of that work is not just classifier, but we need to give that feedback, that stimulation by some way we need to give this feedback to the, uh, to the person. So now we have a problem, right? If you see that, that if, you know, those sensors that we develop, you know, well, three by three, 10 by 10, 100 by 100. If Eric has his way, it'll be much bigger sensor array. But the stimulation that we can give back is highly limited. So how do you compress that information and be selective to both input and the output? So it's a, it's a difficult problem of algorithmically, how do you compress information to give that information back to the person? So you know he's again therefore looking uh, at this uh, on this looking at these different textures, different classic you know, as you see these blue and red are slow and fast uh, neurons, and um, you know this is I think I mean I would say Mark's work in progress because it's been presented at a conference, an ER conference and so on, and is working towards a journal paper, but uh, you know he'll need these different tools for. Um, are these spikes trained similar or different? And so there are dip, these spike train information or distance measure or information theoretic measures that we can, or he should be able to use for his algorithmic work. 
And uh, then he has developed this algorithm for channel selection, uh, asking a question that should the channels, the, the, are the sensors uh, to be selected randomly or is there a, some selectivity algorithm? Uh, of course, the more the channels, the higher the accuracy. So this is a very much an active work in progress. I can tell who is in the audience, but if Mark is there, Mark, hurry up and finish this because I presented it on your behalf. Okay, so I think I want, let me take a pause here to see if there is any question because so just to reiterate to everyone, what I have done is to present to you the problem of tactile sensing and processes. Uh, some, uh, you know, basic e-skin and then neuromorphic uh, algorithm. So, the remaining part is a bit more neuroscience. And then after that, uh, general topic of processes and where things are going. So is there any question? And it, I can pause here for you to grasp and pick my brain or challenge my students and my work. So let me take a pause. This is nice work. Um, I have a quick question. How do you map the how do you preserve the spatial map when you feed back the sensory input back um, for brain encoding? Yeah, I'm, I'm, well, okay. So first of all, so I stopped sharing so we can see each other. This is so impersonal, it's, it's not uh, fun that way. Okay, so actually that is a bit of a hint on what Mark should be doing. Uh, so we have a, 10, three by three, 10 by 10 array, right? So that means that there is a, essentially one-to-one -one map. I mean, that's the easy part. And therefore from there to create a classifier, I know the spatial and temporal. So it's a spatial temporal decoding problem. It can also be compression problem because it's a lot of data. I don't know whether the, your question referred to it, but the question we are grappling with is that when you have these high density sensor array producing high sensor spiking activity, how do you bring it down to a fewer channels that are returned to the body? Now, again, then there is a question of, is there a one-to-one -one, one spatial map? Well, I think further up you go, not, right? Like it's the same thing as in vision, right? I mean, that, uh, that kind of from retina to further up, there's more complex encoding in the brain. So even here in the nerves, nerves are messy. Nerves are made up of what I call fascicles and myelinated and unmyelinated, and it's all mixed up and a lot of fascicles and fibers. So how that code goes in, we don't know. I mean, we do right now have an active grant to say, does the neuromorphic spiking stimulation better than rate coding or some you know standard spiking codes, right? I mean, rate of spiking activity or amplitude. So we don't know that. And I think that's this is a challenging problem and it's a bigger problem because of the interface to either to the skin or to the nerve because that microelectronics, microelectrode array for the nerve is a problem. And on the skin, skin is fairly, you know, it's a, it's a low pass filter. So, you know, this, this is, totally active. Now, some people are sticking straight to the brain and somehow brain stimulation also is able to see, yeah, it's rough or hard. You know, it's, it can do some classification without us fully algorithmic knowing how it does it. I don't know whether I fully answered your question, but it's really the question of the day. Any other questions before I go on? Okay, well, I mean, feel free to interrupt. So I'll share the skin or the screen again and continue a little bit because I think there's going to have to be some neuroscience here, right? Because the question starts with the receptor, then the, you know, the skin and C skin and so on, and then into the nerve and the further level up. So uh, this is again work with Mahmoud and his students that we have skin, periphery, but then, you know, there are different layers in the nervous system. Um, so the cuneate nucleus is the one that is the kind of intermediate way station. And from there to the sensory cortex. So putting it all together, I think it's a 
huge simplification, but at least we need to start that kind of a modeling process. So we start with the periphery, then move to the intermediate level, to the cuneate, to the cortex, right? And you know, it's not like there are a huge amount of data available to model this system, although some people like Sal and uh, UK and um, you know Bansmay and so on have done some work on the modeling of this nervous system. So that's helpful to us. So let's go back to that simple problem of edge detection, right? If we, I mean, why do we use our hand and figure? I mean, we want to palpate, we want to look at edge and you know, we can tell, I mean, that's, if somebody is blind, they're going to look at braille. So it's, it's a very basic unit. So if we have an edge, it creates a pressure profile. From that, there's a receptive field, just like vision has a receptive field. So for touch, we can do the same. Uh, and take it into the cuneate model and then go to some other you know, sensory cortex. So there is a, you have to model the receptive field on the front end and then different layers and then go up the nervous system in this model. So this is, this is the basically the first of this kind modeling effort. And, um, you know, what you get are, you know, it, this and it's not, it should be somewhat familiar to people in vision and other field or people who look at receptive fields. So that there are again, these, these edge that the, if I'm palpating, then you can see the patch of skin with the little dots are the spiking activity will be active based on, um, and of course there is excitatory inhibitory uh, interplay for a patch of skin. So I think that for us to fully understand the encoding of the skin, we will have to go deeper into this direction. This is our first attempt at uh, modeling. Um, and so, so again, in this case, uh, you know, you start with the, the receptors. There is of course a filtering because skin, everything is effectively a big low pass filter is a Kevich model, produce the spiking activity at the receptor level and then take it further up. And so this is the beautiful animation that Mahmoud and his students prepared. So you can see that uh, starting with the primary efferent to the cuneate nucleus, to the somatosensory cortex, you can now see the whole tactile uh, encoding going on up, up the nervous system. Uh, I don't, know how we would be able to really validate it, but it's based on a lot of the known assumptions about how the neurons encode in these areas, but much less studied a topic than say a visual system. So there's a lot of interesting active work to be done here. Many of you are good neuroscientists and like modeling, please come and collaborate with us. Okay, so let's go back to practical reality, all right? And, um, you know, I, I mean, this is Alcimar and uh, Andre, his student put together this, uh, uh, I think it's playing, what happened? This video, uh, okay, I guess it's not playing. Um, some reason, yeah, nice music. <laughs> so, you know, so I the hand and so. Anyway, so with two hands, uh, and we have a actually neuromorphic uh, camera from the you know Zurich people. And so it tells you where the object is, and the receptor, the sensors are on the fingertip, and then one hand is grasping. What you see? Let me let me mute it. So what you see is the on the lower right hand corner are the receptor, the skin sensors telling you so the, uh, that you're grasped, and then when you're rotating, the slip. So, so I think this is a system that's now kind of like operational, it was operational back in Singapore where you can make two robotic arms, um, grasp an object and do this kind of manipulation. So looking at the objects with vision, uh, that's all it does. And then hand creates aperture and then the sensors help you with slip and uh, texture. Okay, so now this comes to the cool, really, really nice work that um, uh, going back to Luke Osborne uh, that he did. So he, this is the prosthetic hand. Now it's everyday hand in our labs. Uh, you know, it's a B Bionic and this company and then Infinite Biomedical puts it together for us. On uh, fingers are all these flexible touch sensors. And uh, what, 
now what he's showing is that can you palpate and perceive different types of objects? So the, you can see on the upper right hand corner different shapes. So, you know, look at this kind of experiment. I mean, you can see that different shapes, uh, you know, there's a finger manipulation and then he is able to touch. But look at when you have touches a sharp object. The sharp object elicits a pain-like reflex, you know, because that's how we react. So that's what this first robotic animation that he did showed that you can now not only just have a skin for pressure and so on, but also for pain. That part of it actually took off because that, that's really important and interesting in prosthetics to understand pain. So Luke continued this work uh, and, uh, you know, basically, it's a full system of a neuromorphic activity, e-skin, and then electrical stimulation to give sensory feedback. So, um, you know, as this simulation shows, the pressure applied to any given finger produces spiking activity, and based on that, you'll get electrical stimulation. So, <clears throat> so how is the pain encoded? So, pain is encoded like like a reflex loop, right? You have a sharp object, so there's a spinal reflex loop. So. He implemented that. <clears throat> I'll also show some of the brain activity later. So this is uh, Luke's e e Dermis work with a number of students, Chris and Harris and others worked on it. So Harrison, uh, and so this, see, this, this is George, one of, uh, he's a bilateral amputee. He was in my lab as a master's student and extremely willing volunteer and collaborator. So he's operating the prosthetic hand. Uh, the, the fingers have the, E skin on it or e dermis as we call it. He's able to, and he's getting feedback. So he's grasping that object based on feedback. He's getting that small electrocutaneous stimulation feedback. <clears throat> so based on that, he's, you know, and of course this are small objects. So he's real time, you know, there's a decoding and then real time control of the fingers. And now see when it comes to a sharp object, he's gonna get more painful stimulus. The tingling will be higher and therefore he, he reacts. So there's a reflex that is built in so that he feels that this is a sharp or sensory object. So I thought that was a very cool uh, idea and very cool demonstration. Okay, so, so now um, do we feel it, right? So that's the next level question that does the brain feel it? So we put EEG cap on the person and uh, yep, there is some so much sensory activation of this, but of course, EEG is not so precise in source localization and all of that. So it needs to be yet another very elaborate work to say that if we sense it, does the brain perceive it? So we have just received a recent new NIH grant or NSF grant to go into some of the sensory encoding that. His work is now being done by Catherine, again, one of my PhD students with Andre, a collaborator in Europe. So this is Luke's work. By the way, you might, I mean, look at this. This is really interesting. You, you know, these are MPDs. And these colors shows, this is what, you know, you have to do meticulous mapping of the sensory percepts because the nerves have gone in all kinds of strange places. So, you know, you see these green, blue, and red, those are receptive fills. These are projected receptive fields. So if you stimulate here, you say, well, that's my index finger and my second finger. Or if it's red, it's something else. Plus, you know, you get this different sensation like vibration and pressure and hot and cold. So, you know, you have to do really meticulous mapping. But now what Catherine is looking at it is that, how do we sense and how do we integrate all this information? So this is very complicated. I, I'm not gonna go into this, but you know, brain is encoding. You saw in that video I showed you that vision, touch, proprioception, position are all being integrated together. So what Catherine working with Andrea is doing is mapping the brain activity. These are able-bodied amputees because I think what's happening in the process's work is that sensory information is getting encoded, the touch and vision. So you, you see and grasp to have it together. So this graph is, uh, the reds are motor cortex and the blues are somatosensory and green are what we call multi-sensory integrations, areas on the EEG map that 
show that they work when things are integrated. So this is another active area of research. So by the way, I'm presenting to you either very active or ongoing work, okay? And happy to, so, so I think I'm kind of more like coming to an end uh, and I will be guided by the, how much time you're gonna give me, uh, you know, just, you know, of course you can, I mean, this is work at Pittsburgh, you can do direct cortical stimulation. And what they and did is they directly stimulate the brain and the subject is able to say, yeah, this is this finger, or it's that finger. Place is that as the researcher applies light pressure to the robotic fingers, mm -hmm. those physical sensations are converted into electrical signals that are fed directly. Okay, so you get that idea that even, um, you know, so many people are probably by now familiar with this kind of direct brain machine interface. So it's definitely possible to give direct cortical stimulation and elicit the same percepts. Similarly, Peripherally is possible too. So this is work at Case Western where they put wires, little micro wires via skin into the nerves. And uh, the subject can kind of tell it's rough, smooth, uh, hard or soft, some subjective classification based on electrical stimulation that's been given. So uh, what I'm saying is that we can give sensory feedback via skin, via nerve, via brain very active seeing. ongoing work uh, at applied physics lab. Now it's like bimanual, two arms. And uh, you know, uh, now there are extra set of electrodes in the brain for grasps and manipulation. So I, I, I think you probably have heard enough of this brain machine interface. So I, I don't wanna go into that great detail, but I think in this again, having uh, sensory information and sensory encoding is needed. So Luke is now an active player in this group to provide that direct cortical sensory stimulation. So I think in conclusion, I mean, a lot of people, you all have heard about motor processes. Today I opened the door on sensory processes if you're not working in that area. And, uh, you know, I, conveyed that uh, interface is at all levels. I mean, I'm, I didn't get into spine, but periphery and brain, although for practical purposes, via skin. So, you know, this multiple level of uh, this. Okay, so again, uh, can you tell me how I'm doing in time so I can spend some time looking at emerging problems? Uh, do I have time? Uh, yeah, there's 10 minutes left uh, officially, but uh, thank okay. you. Okay, I, I could, uh, before I go into any of this thing, uh, let me take a pause and, you know, then I will just uh, see if you have any questions up to this point, and then we can just sort of think about future directions. So any questions here? Yeah, I was um, interested for the deep brain stimulation and the other, the nerve stimulation. How much of the feedback is experienced as coming from the right part of the hand or whatever? And how much is just like, well, I know this sensation happens, to, you know, they've they marked it to my index finger. So now I know it's my index finger. How much of that is being learned by the person? And how much yeah. of it is like? Yeah. yeah. I mean, all this is individual and extremely subjective, but let's go back. First of all, it's not deep brain stimulation, direct somatosensory, you know, layer four, layer five, cortical micro stimulation. Same thing with nerves. I mean, you put a little micro wires into the nerve and it goes to some nerve fascicle and you stimulate and ask the subject, what do you feel? So both those cases, it's extremely empirical. It's kind of like subject tells you. So we have a lot more experience with epidermal skin-based stimulation, and you have to go around meticulously mapping. That's why the graphic that I showed you uh, was uh, very important because that's what representation is. If I can go back, I mean, you know, the amputee is, uh, this is the mapping. And this mapping is carrying over in a, some kind of a way up. So if it's this mapping here on the skin, think about what the mapping on the nerve will be and after that in the brain. So really you have to go and map and say, yep, green is index finger. So I found the index finger for the subject. So now that I can stimulate there, then I will evoke a pressure sensation for this subject. And, um, but I think it's not so bad in the sense that um, 
at least for the nerve and the brain, they're both able to say, subject is able to say it's smooth versus rough, um, but it's it depends on where your electrodes are. So you know, it's really a matter of, of keeping, putting the electrodes, touching the electrodes until the right sensation is. I think it's like in every all BMI, it's no different than what's happening in motor. It's not like we have a precise logo. You know, I worked on uh, finger decoding for a long time. I mean, you don't, there's no finger A, you know, index finger this. It's a, in M1, there's a mixture of lots of neurons and you have to develop a algorithm to decode from a population of neurons for a particular task. And I think in this case, it's the same, that it's, there's no, I mean, there's a homunculus, but it's so crude. And you know, then we get down to a fingertip, we don't have it. So you, you, you have, you'll have to do uh, subject specific uh, stimulation. Now, of course you can't do that. So you do an array for brain, you'll do array with nerve, it's very hard because nerves are moving, stretching, flexible, it's very tiny. So if you put array, you're gonna create a damage. So if you really wanna be practitioner to help an amputee, I think the epidermal skin works quite well. Now, if nerve-based implant is a, you know, there are, there were DARPA like programs and others to say, can we do nerve-based interface? And, you know, eventually our dream will be cortical, right? I mean, you know, that brain is sexy. So, you know, why don't we do cortical micro stimulation? But um, I think it'll be high density array. And then, you know, we'll have to develop algorithm based on experience to elicit different sensory percepts. Let me kind of, I mean, I'm, you know, please feel free all of you to interrupt me. I mean, I'm going to take say just whatever few minutes you have to sort of talk about the you know, future uh, directions in some way, although I've already sprinkled some of them. So, so you know, we are all enamored by the, I mean, we are all publicly aware of the processes side of things, you know, so control the prosthetic hand, right? But uh, people are not as familiar with uh, nerve injury. So this is when people have nerve injury, you have an intact arm, sorry, the video isn't working, but this person, I mean, it's a, it's an arm without any function. And so um, this animation captures that, that what happens is that if there's a nerve injury to travel accident, uh, there's a brachial plexus injury to happens to infants during birth, sports, then you know the nerves get damaged, the muscles get atrophied and uh, you lose sensory innovation and of course motor function. So nerve limb injury is a big problem. So I think in this case, there's a lot to be done, like to study the nerve regeneration in this sort of microfluidic system. We are showing how exons can grow. Um, you heard me talk about spiking activity and um, you know that's both encoding problem when you sense and stimulation in stochastic manner. That's a big problem. Uh, all of this has to be packaged in an implant, right? I mean, you know, this has to be a micro miniature. Well, VLSI, whatever it is in the system. And then, you know, you have to, some of these uh, tactile work is not easy at all. Sensory work is done on uh, on uh, rats, right? So you want to want to go into monkeys and that's a big uh, step up in terms of how to do these experiments to provide that sensory stimulation so that you achieve a individual finger stimulation and then sensory percept. Uh, so, you know, the, it, it's a kind of like a in highly integrated problem to make this happen. Um, this, uh, you know, I showed you this just to rec remind you, I mean, you know, people who have amputees, uh, you know, this, this is again, probably EPFL and other European work. So you heard about that. This is Stanis Araspovic at uh, Zurich. He is now doing the same thing with foot. Because people get diabetic foot and um, neuropathy and uh, cancer neuropathy. So providing sensory restoration to foot is also interesting. I mean, this is one of the videos he had shared uh, where, you know, it's, it's extremely crude right now, but, you know, he's providing stimulation and then subject says, well, I feel stimulation here, right? So he's applying that force. So it's stimulating and he uh, relates it to a location. So this is that work in the area of providing sensory feedback to the foot. 
So I think this video now might work. So this is that brachial plexus injury or the nerve injury. And you can see there's no control of the limb. And this is a, a area that has not been worked on. Um, <clears throat> this is a very interesting work out of University of Michigan where <clears throat> they use muscles. So nerve goes to muscle and then use the muscle for decoding purposes. So he, this person is very achieving very good dexterous control to nerve muscle interface. So these are some glimpse of some active areas. So again, there's a whole field of motor processes, whole field of sensory. I, mean, I, I just talked about touch. Nobody's looking at proprioception, which is a, a harder problem. Um, and so uh, this is our work, uh, field of brain, mind, you know, I would say now I'm calling it machine to brain interface. Uh, improve the processes, you know, soft robotics and so on, improve the interface. So we're working on these nerve muscle interfaces. Uh, there's a DARPA project we have on ultrasound based spinal cord interface and then uh, some of the neuromuscular interface active area. So <clears throat> I've started collaboration with Gordon Chang in Germany who is like this humanoid robot. So someday maybe we'll build this high density sensor for the whole humanoid if my... Eric, my PhD student, scales up his uh, problem. Uh, I told you about neuromorphic engineering work that Mark is doing. Uh, Sri is working on soft robotics. Um, the neuro part of it is there. So Catherine, one of my PhD students working on it. So here, I think this I'll stop because of time. <clears throat> there are a lot of problems. I mean, you know, in robotics area. So take your time to read through it. Uh, uh, soft robotics, soft skin, e-skin, of course, uh, encoding, decoding problems, uh, <clears throat> neuromorphic modeling of receptors and nerves, and sensory feedback, including that of pain. So this is the, hopefully just to give you a glimpse of ongoing and future directions. Um, yeah, very multidisciplinary work. So we need to all work together. <clears throat> It's very hard to form big teams. I mean, I have many graduate students, but to scale it to outside the lab has not been easy. I want to thank a number of the students. I mentioned several of them. And there was a team at, in Singapore who also did some of the work in the past. So thank you. You know, thank you for your patience. I hope I was clear enough and told you something new. Thank you. It was very interesting. So if you have any questions, please uh, ask the Nitish. We can have, a, we have like another 15 minutes at least. So I will extend a little bit. Uh, so please feel, feel free to ask uh, directly the questions. I see minutes. Bert here before, you know, I couldn't see who was attending. Hey, uh, yeah. what, what, a, what a, so sad that you left Hopkins. I, 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 when you get tired of San Diego, La Jolla weather, we welcome you back. It's lovely fall colors. It's pretty, campus is open. Thank you, okay. thank you. And the same here, you're always welcome to come here in person. It's, it's so sad when we're getting you here in this virtual Zoom format still, but uh, yeah, definitely come visit us when, when, you're, when you're in the neighborhood here. So I have a question for you, so, so Nitish. This is great work as, as, as usual, uh, very, very impressive work. Um, and so you touch both on the uh, neuromorphic uh, interfaces, the modeling, right? And on, on the, the actual real neural interface, right? The physical, is by going to the wetware, right? So you're kind of bridging silico, in silico, and in vivo, right? So, so, to, so give us an, a, um, um, and as you showed very nice examples of you can, how, how you can marry the two, right? And get both the inspiration, help uh, greater sensors, uh, and then how the better sensors can also help get better, um, uh, because inroads in, in understanding how the brain works, right? That, that's that's nice. But so, um, to what extent do you think it will be important for practical neural interfaces to really capture those neuromorphic, uh, the the, uh, the models exactly? And then, to what extent can you be pragmatic and just getting something that, that that works, right? So, so in other words, uh, where is the the uh, the divine line, or where is the um, uh, where do you cross the boundary between biophysical realism in, in modeling and doing this in silico uh, systems that that uh, we want to then interface with the nervous system? And to what extent is just a matter of just uh, being pragmatic and, and getting something that that works uh, very efficiently? I guess. Right? I mean, as all science goes, I mean, it's, we have to put it as a hypothesis. The hypothesis would be 
that the stochastic spiking stimulus input modeled after typical spiking response that we see. And in case of skin, the slow and fast adaptive, given via different types of nerves, again, slow, fast, myelinated, unmyelinated, is what brain is used to getting. So the hypothesis would be that neuromorphic input would be sensed or perceived more correctly, appropriately, accurately by the brain. Now, thing about brain is there's plasticity, right? So in some level, brain kind of can learn just about anything. And so I suppose with enough repetitive trial, you can give different rate codes or something and brain probably could do that. So what we are going to do, and you know, pandemic has slowed things down, students have digressed in different direction, but it's exactly answer the question that on the skin level, if we gave stochastic response uh, stimulus, would they provide better sensory perception? So now the framework is, yeah, what is sensory perception? It can be edge, it can be shape, it can be texture, it is slip and grasp. These are things we do. Well, then you can go into other things like temperature and pain. Yeah, I mean, I hope I can answer the question. I think at the brain level, my gut feeling in the end will be the plasticity will overrule everything. But if we are at the peripheral and nerve level, I think the more biomimetic we make it, it's good. And you know, like if I can philosophize, I mean, that's it's been a challenge for neuromorphic, right? I mean, cameras they do so well, so why do I need neuromorphic camera? And we have some justification like power. So I think here there is a justification um, that they, that that code is nature's code. And we must, I think as a hypothesis, we must follow the nature's code. Very, very good, uh, Nishin. And you're picking up on a very important point. Like, uh, so for many years uh, with imagers, we used to have those, uh, um, we were, or at least the, uh, the image processing uh, image uh, or indeed the vision community uh, was apprehensive of all the normal advances because sure, you can do so much better with the camera and then this salt and pepper noisy kind of images that came out of this first silicon retinas. But now recently the whole thing has turned around because now people realize that uh, if you actually want to really get information at the information, right, it doesn't make sense to kind of keep sending pixels, uh, frames and frames of, of the same pixels over and over again. And so this dynamic vision sensors have actually become quite uh, quite important. Exactly. And I would imagine and that- Part of that doing that to get yes. the DBS based on, uh, yes. retinal processes, yeah. Yes, I mean, retinal prosthesis or, or uh, cochal prosthesis, and and now you make a great point of, of having um, haptic uh, prosthesis. Uh, you, you may imagine that having this this more biophysical interfaces uh, yeah. will give you a lot better coding, even though things may not as has been as clean or, or as as manageable or as as uh, uh, controllable as that it would be. Uh, with a neuromorphic event-driven approach, but I can imagine that that more more neuromorphic neural interfaces, as as Fred and others have been doing here, that would be a really the way to go in, in the future. Yeah, I would make uh, like so. Okay, there's a sensing side, and then there's a stimulation or yes. feedback side. And yeah. on the sensing side, I would like to think that neuromorphic will provide us compression because you know you take thousand by thousand tactile sensor or a analog to digital, this and this and that. You, you know, spike code will be a beautiful compression and unlike vision because the speeds are much lower yes. of things happening. Yes. So, you know, this temporal and spatial encoding and compression yeah. is also nature's way of dealing with it, right? We got the whole skin and we got these thin, fine few nerves and then a bunch of fibers, right? So that compression uh, of course, in vision, it's there too, but I'm saying that that's another, probably a very valid reason why it's a spike coding of a tactile system. Mm -hmm. Beautiful work, Nindish, thank you. You know, it, it, I almost always feel like the skin is a, like a, I don't know, poor cousin of uh, vision because yes. of course the visual system has it's so such a powerful lobby in the camera. And of yes. course it was yes. the big start for neuromorphic people. Yes. And so there is a much smaller tactile community. A lot more people working on 
skins like e-skin, organic, thin film, flexible, variety of physical sensors and so on. Yeah. And a very, very small group working on neuromorphic um, encoding and yeah. even less smaller group saying, oh, we are going to do experiments to do that. Yeah. Uh, and no matter what, it's going to require some teaming. So um, yeah, this, this one needs some team effort to take it to some next level. Absolutely. The olfactory team could probably join, right? Because olfaction has also been neglected for many years, but now with Enos technologies is coming yeah. to the forefront too. Right? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, uh, we can kind of like free form discussion, right? Olfactory is really simple and probably the most difficult. So why is it simple? Because like really it's olfactory nerve, you straight into the brain, right? In some way it's simpler. Why it's more, more difficult because it's the largest number of receptors, right? Mm -hmm. Vision has rods and cones and this and that. Skin, we have got four of these receptors, slow, fast. Olfactory, you've got thousands of receptors. So finding a chemical signature. So he knows has always been a kind of a bit of a mirage. And the second is like, so like he knows as a way to look at, I don't know, bomb or chemical. Yes, but do people who have anosmic, do they need it? So it doesn't have an incentive in a like a way as neuroprocesses. Right. Uh, I am not aware of the literature which has converted these complex receptors in the nose into spike coding to create a pattern recognition of different molecules. So I'm not aware of the literature. So in that regard, it could be very challenging and interesting. Any other questions? No one. All right. So, oh yes, Josh, John. Sorry. I have one question. Okay. Go on. Uh, are you working in some temperature uh, sensors in the <laughs> skin? <sighs> okay. Well. I mean, I mentioned my student Eric, I mean, you know, as a part of a class project, uh, he did it. And I have a paper with Gordon Cheng on uh, same thing in temperature, I think it was in scientific report and such. Yes, so we did do a little bit of that, uh, more like cognitive. Can you, how does the brain perceive temperature sensation? We haven't done any work on building high density temperature sensor arrays, so neither have I done any work on encoding, but you know, we have touch, then we have temperature, then we need proprioception, we have pain. I mean, these are all our peripheral systems. So each has a role. Uh, I would say that tactile system is better understood. Remember Nobel prize this year. So, um, you know, uh, but proprioception is kind of like in the yes. more really important and not uh, as much in vogue. And, you know, it's hard to know what to do with temperature other than, you know, I mean, hot and cold, the reflex so that you don't get burn your skin and so on. So for processes, it's kind of like not so interesting and active area of work. Um, and I'm just reflecting broadly what I see by way of literature. I would say I see a lot more paper in decent journals on building e-skins, like with all kind of micro nanofabrication and so on much less encoding and even less uh, these things like compression and feedback and mostly tactile, much, much less other modalities. Yeah, that is a challenge to combine at the same time mechanical sensors that uh, temperature sensors and together in the same space. No, that's... Yeah, if you're a Sensor designer, I mean, it clearly poses an interesting challenge, right? I mean, and then you have to put all of those multi-sensory integration, right? I mean, so it's whichever form of pressure, temperature, vibration, um, these receptors are differently um, encoding. So in some way, therefore, I would say skin is more complicated than retina. Uh, I mean, you can argue, but I mean, it's because it has a greater variety of um, perception and rate because you know it's slow and fast and vibration is something else and the pain is really fast so there are this different scale and temperature is one other piece of that so again that's why i said that's the nobel prize right they found this temperature sensitive channels and so on so 
I think that's at the molecular level what the receptors are, uh, what the Nobel Prize in Physiology was about. But you know, then the encoding work goes from there. So I think for like uh, it's the similar thing like with the modeling, the uh, knowing about hair cells and modeling them, and then converting, which is really a lot of studied by bi biophysics and folks in um, uh, ret you know auditory physiology. But then there's a whole second topic of encoding. So it's it's really the nervous system is similar, right? You have a receptor with its own complexity and then this whole you know, encoding, which let's call it neuromorphic, and then this brain for classifying and so on. Your talk was very interesting um, and stimulating too. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comment. So thank you, Nitesh, again. Okay, well, thank you for inviting. Good interaction. Let's hopefully we'll do something live someday. Meet somewhere, maybe Telluride. We'll see. Okay. Tell it will be real this this coming uh, summer, right? Is it going yeah. to be? It should yeah. be. I don't see any reason not to. Yeah, we just saw Toby here. So Toby tells us that uh, yeah, Telluride will be real. He invites all of us to apply. And, yeah. uh, so a few years ago, when uh, you know I was active and there were like two or three of us teamed up uh, at Telluride, it was very interesting. What we did was to um, there was a neurologist from Australia who came. So two of my students and then the neurologist and then you know the others who I collaborated with. So we brought our e-skin robotic hand. Students did the that part of it, but the more interesting part was a little, you know, you put a little microwire in, in text, you know, there was IRB for it. So he did that and recorded spiking activity while you're touching. And then you see the spikes coming out from the nerve. Mm -hmm. So um and I think then they got carried away. I wasn't, because I left after only a few days, but they were also then integrating it with True North, but I don't think that went too far. Uh, but irrespective, uh, you know, at Telluride to be able to work with the sensor, the spiking activity, having the system, and then having somebody, you know, you put little microwires and they're recording. Yeah, I mean, could make for very interesting in-person meeting. All right. Well, thank you for having okay. me. And, Thanks so much, uh, uh, you know, yeah. yeah, my pleasure. Good luck, everyone, and stay in touch. Stay safe. See you. See you. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.